Yo, what's up? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Tuesday, January 28th, 2020. I'm one of your hosts, Blessing, Addy Oye Jr., and joining me is Imran, the Don Khan. Imran, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How about you, Blessing? Man, it's been a day. <laughs> it's, <laughs> already. Only, it's only 10 a.m., and it's already been a morning. I had one of those mornings where, you know when your alarm goes off? And you just, you just lie there, and you're like, how long can I lie here until I have to get up? Mm. You know, I had one of those ones where I'm like, all right, I'm just going to push this because I'm tired. I spent all yesterday drinking champagne. Like, I started at 10 a.m. drinking champagne, and I went on to, like, 5 p.m. or so. Um, and so I didn't get the best sleep. But, yeah, I woke up, and I was like, I'm going to lay here. Wait, so I thought that was just a bit for the show. Like, no. Okay. We drank, we drank at, like, cups of champagne during KOGD, and then on PSLVXOXO, drank even more champagne, and I lost count because Greg kept refilling my cup. <laughs> and I didn't notice that he was refilling my cup, so I was like, man, I'm really taking a long time to drink this, like, one small cup of champagne. Uh -huh. But it kept going and going and going. Um, so I had that, and then on my way to work, there was a lot of traffic, which I had not experienced before. You know, mm -hmm. from my route from home to work. And so there was that. And then once I got here, there was like an explosion sound. Yes. <laughs> that, um, like, like I think we, we, me and Kevin heard it. And I think Greg heard it. And I think we all had different thoughts. Because I was like, oh, there's there's been a car accident. And Kevin's like, no, I think the roof caved in. <laughs> and <laughs> we're like. Wait, wait, real quick. Just to give you a little, just so you know yeah. why I thought that. Right above you, there used to be a skylight. Uh-huh. And the other day it leaked. Like, we were doing screencast. Okay. I was just listening to that episode noise. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it was one of those things where we were like, oh, and I was like, oh, shit, it broke. I've honestly been, like, <laughs> counting the days until, like, the LaCroix stuff just caves in the roof here. Oh, we That's going to happen. We beat that. No, <laughs> it's, it's right now, it is literally a fourth to an eighth. I think it's about an eighth of what we originally had. We, uh -huh. we're, we've won that war. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I, I feel like at this point it's a race to the next studio because try to get them all. <laughs> I, get feel, really this one I feel like this one's going to collapse at a certain point because, yeah, I heard that sound and I was like, are we are we safe? And then we go you outside. Guys, you guys have no idea how like when the studio was full to the brim with Lacroix cans, walking around in certain areas, you'd be like, "Oh shit, this is not good for the floors." <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> Everyone drink as much as possible. See, like, and so when we heard that sound, right, we went outside and we smelled smoke. Yeah. To which I was like, "Oh sweet, we get to cancel the show this morning. I get to go back home and sleep." But it turns out what it was was somebody was sending out fireworks. Yeah. When I came in, I I smelled burning and my, like. What this says about me, I don't know, but the first thought was, is somebody barbecuing out here? Oh, yeah. It's like, it's, it's pouring rain outside. It's kind of outside. funny doing a, a barbecue stream. Like, it's pouring rain outside, so none of that this. makes sense. I wouldn't put it past this, you know what I mean? <laughs> that sounds like something we do. Oh, Kevin got a tent, and we we're barbecuing in the rain. Granted, fireworks in the rain makes no more sense, so. It was yeah. a deliberate attack. <laughs> Imran, how was your weekend? Did you do my, anything cool? My weekend was good. I went to Chicago. Batista Man 340 writes in and says, I just want to thank Imran for announcing that he was going to the Near concert back in November. You're welcome. If it, wasn't for, if it wasn't for that, I would have never been able to fly out to Chicago this past weekend and have one of the greatest experiences of my life. I was tearing up from the moment it started, and by the time the, the first set ended with Kane, the tears wouldn't stop falling. You will forever have my thanks, and Near 3 can't come soon enough. Imran, you went to the Near concert this weekend. Mm -hmm. How was it? It was really good. It was the first near concert ever, and for a a series, I guess that has that much uh, well loved music, it's shocking mm -hmm. that this is the first one. Yeah. So like, I I just really wanted to go, and I wanted to be part of that, and that meant going to Chicago in January. So I gladly did that. I bought tickets for my girlfriend and I, and she, we both went in there, and it was I. I fucking love Nier's music. Yeah. The music in... I've only played Nier Automata, which I think we've talked about on the show before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is probably one of my favorite soundtracks ever made. Like, right. it is incredible. The things they do in terms of... I think for Nier Automata specifically, they create they, they created their own language to sing certain songs in. Like, a mixture of, like, French and I think, like, Japanese in right. certain languages. Which is something I'd, I'd never heard before. And it's a very unique sounding... There's a there's a unique sound to the to the near automata music mm -hmm. that I really like and like the way in which they implement vocals and kind of mix them in with with their instrumentals I feel like they do a really good job with that yeah song. I think last year was it last year or year before last I talked to Keiichi Okabe about it mm -hmm. and he was the composer for both near and near automata like why do you use constructed languages for this sort of thing and his answer was like it just makes it feel more fantasy and ethereal yeah. and strange it's a very unique sound and I really like it yeah did they do um uh this cannot continue. The no, concert. they didn't. Dang. That's upsetting. They didn't do that, and they didn't do children's song, but I guess they would need an actual chorus of children. Oh, like uh, Pascal's Pascal, Village? Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. Dang, dude. Like, they had a chorus, and, like, you could tell they were kind of limited by facts that, like, 
Emmy Evans was there. She was like the one who sings the kind of French con- constructed language versions mm. of songs. But Janique Nicole was not there, so they couldn't do a decent number of Automata songs like mm-hmm. "Way of the World" and stuff like. Well, they did "Way of the World," but not like that specific thing. <sighs> I, I'm trying to think of the song. It's like a ballad, like a slower song that they sing. I'm gonna look it up because mm-hmm. like, it's hard for me to describe the song. But there's like one song where it's mostly vo- it's mostly vocal. It's a lady singing. And it's a really beautiful song that happens during like a, like a slower moment in your Automata. Right. I want to ask if they did that one. They started with the near soundtrack. That was the first half of the. And as somebody like a concert, I was a, as someone who prefers the near soundtrack to near Automata because mm-hmm. I do think it's a bit be, it's a better soundtrack overall. It was funny to see the people who like were there because Automata is a much more popular game, but the people who were there just for Automata and were very confused by that whole section. Really. Like, if you compare the pops. After each song for Near versus Automata, mm-hmm. that was nowhere close. People were clapping their heads off for Automata, and like it was like polite clapping for Near. And like, I guess yeah, yeah. yeah, I didn't realize how niche that game was in comparison. And to the point where a guy would next to me was complaining, like, I can't believe they're starting with this and not Automata, like vocally out really? loud. Yes, man. I, I, I mean, you mentioned how like it's it's surprising that this is, this is the first Near concert, given how much people love that 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 uh, the soundtrack to those games. But Near is. Is still like a very niche franchise overall. Yeah. Like Nier Automata was, I feel like the one that, like I don't, I don't even think Nier Automata really broke out that much. But it was I feel like, like four million it, copies. Okay, so that, yeah, that is actually a pretty good, yeah. pretty good amount of sales. But I feel like that's the one that kind of brought a certain amount of people in. Right. And I feel like that game has garnered a certain amount of respect for how well it's constructed in its narrative and in some of the elements like the soundtrack mm-hmm. um, and its style and stuff. And so I think that makes sense. Uh, I can't find the, the song I'm looking for. It's such a good song, though. Uh, just listen to the Nier Automata soundtrack. Yeah, it's listen to the YouTube. whole thing. Just listen to the whole thing, because all the songs are amazing. There's also an arrangement CD, a piano CD. All yeah. those are good. And they're all on Spotify, because they got put on there recently, right? About two weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, so go listen to that. Speaking of amazing, today's stories include a surprise Witcher release, Pokemon Home, and more, because this is Kind of Funny Games Daily, each and every weekday at 10 a.m. live, right here on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. If you're watching live, you can correct us when we get stuff wrong by going to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. If you don't want to watch live, you can watch later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames, or listen later on podcast services around the globe by searching for kind of funny games daily to be a part of the show head to patreon.com slash kind of funny games where bronze members or above get to write in and silver members or above get the show ad free now it's time for some housekeeping our first impressions video pat upon 2 remastered is now up <laughs> on youtube.com slash kind of funny games and on uh, the games cast feed for a podcast and let me tell you man what a game. <laughs> Did that get added by you, like that part of the housekeeping? That, that was added by me. Okay. Yeah. I've been trying to sure. do a good job of like trying to, you know, remind people what's going on. I, on I just channel. wasn't sure if like that was like I'm sure Greg would have added it. You woke up to a doc that just had that on it. Oh, I mean, if I didn't write it, I'm sure Greg would have added <laughs> okay. it. But definitely check out that first impressions. If you're curious on why Greg loves Patapon and Patapon two and I guess Patapon three. If you're curious on why Greg loves Patapon, Check out that video. He does a pretty good job of laying it out. I'm there asking him questions and trying trying to understand what's happening because visually just watching Patapon, I couldn't really get what was going on on screen until Greg really laid it out for me on PSL of UXOXO and on this stream. So check that out. Uh, and like I said, uh, we also have a new episode of PSL of UXOXO available on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games and on streaming services. That one, it's a really good episode because, like I said, started drinking 10 a.m. yesterday. And by the end of PSLV XLXL, I had lost count of how many cups of champagne I had. So I was like talking about Persona 4 Golden toward the end of the show. And like as I was talking about it, I was like, man, I've had a lot of champagne. <laughs> and I like I was like I was like, what the words I am saying are like they make sense, but they at the same time, I know for a fact that I am like I'm out of control <laughs> right now as I'm talking about Persona 4 Golden. So that's a really fun <laughs> episode. Go listen to that. And speaking of PSLV XOXO, the shirts that we're selling are currently sold out, but there should be uh, some available in a few weeks. We're restocking them. So thank you all for your support, and thank you all for going ham and buying the mess out of this thing. The sweater. Yeah. There's only a sweater, right? There's no other? Just a sweater? Yeah. A hat would be dope. Mm. I brought in a flat brim hat. Because I saw there's a kind of funny, like, they have the, the curved brim, 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 whatever you call it. Just think about it. Flat brim hat with just the logo. Dude, a, f- a flat Woo! brim all hat black. with the PS Love You all lo- black. logo. You know what I mean? I'm all Top about that. Top and bottom that. of it. <laughs> all about that. Thank you to our Patreon producers, Blackjack and Muhammad Muhammad. Today we're brought to you by G.I. Joe, War on Cobra, and oh, yeah. Robin Hood. But I'll tell you about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. 
It's time for some news. We have five stories today. Uh, Baker's Dozen. Starting with number one, Pokemon Home details are out. This is from Nicole Carpenter over at Polygon. When Pokemon Home, the Pokemon Company's cloud-based storage system, launches in February, two pricing options will be available, basic and premium. The company updated its website today with new information about the app. The basic plan is free, but gives player li- gives players limited access to Pokemon Home's features. The ability to move Pokemon from Pokemon Bank and the number of Pokemon that can be deposited, for instance. The premium premium plan has three options, one month for $2.99 and $2.99, three months for $4.99, and 12 months for $15.99. Deciding which plan to get should be easy. If you want to deposit a lot of Pokemon, more than 30, you'll need the premium plan. These are all the features available in each plan, and Polygon has like a, a chart that they lay out, and so I'm going to go through some of these features, right? Moving Pokemon from Pokemon Bank, basic, you can't do that, premium, you can. Number of Pokemon that can be deposited, if you have the basic uh, the basic plan, right, which is free, uh, you can move, you can deposit 30 Pokemon, and if you have the premium plan, man, my, this might, did you uh, X out the chart? Okay, yeah. I, was, I was reading it, it just disappeared, and I was like, did I scroll, scroll away? Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It's on, if you go to Polygon, yeah, you, can just go to you Polygon. should be fine. You should, should be able to find it. Yeah. It should be one of the main stories on the website. Um, but yeah, 30 for basic, 6,000 for premium. Number of Pokemon that can be placed in the Wonder Box at once, 3 for basic, 10 for premium. Number of Pokemon that can be placed in the GTS at once, which I don't know what these words mean. But Pokemon fans, I'm sure you have global an idea. transfer system. I think it was. Is that what it is? Yes. So if you have the basic plan, one. If you have the premium plan, three. And then room trade, basic can participate. Premium can participate and host. And then for judge function, which I don't know what that means, basic uh, no. Premium, yes, you can do that. I actually have no idea what the judge function is. Gotcha. Uh, Pokemon Home will connect on the Nintendo Switch with Pokemon Sword and Shield, Pokemon Let's Go, Pikachu, and Pokemon Let's Go, Eevee. The company noted, however, that a Pokemon moved from Let's Go, Pikachu, or Let's Go, Eevee cannot be moved back to the games once it's been transferred to Sword and Shield. Pokemon can move freely between Let's Go, Pikachu, and Let's Go, Eevee, though. Both the mobile app and Switch versions will allow players to connect to Pokemon Bank, the older Pokemon storage systems from the Nintendo 3DS era. The Pokemon company said Pokemon Home will eventually support Pokemon Go 2, but not at launch. Imran, Mm -hmm. one, do you understand any of this? I understand a decent bit of this. Okay. How do you feel about it? Does it sound like good news to you? I mean, it's fine. It's... The not getting stuff from Pokemon Bank seems like that's just a feature they turned off that mm. they very easily could support for free. They just they want to incentivize premium plans, but for the most part, it's just hey, if you're if you can connect to Pokemon Home, you have a cloud save style service to move your Pokemon around into Sword and Shield or whatever comes next. Yeah, yeah, this seems like a th- like a service that Pokemon fans have wanted for a while because I, I I believe there was a lot of excitement when this was announced. One thing I've seen is that. I, I feel like there is a certain amount of people that are upset over the pricing for this, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, f- was, was it 15 It can be fi- upwards of $16. Yeah, $16 a year. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for 12 months, which... Which is about the same, a little, around what you'd pay for a Nintendo Switch Online in general. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're almost paying, like, twice that membership. Right. Just for Pokemon Home. But I mean, also, like, Pokemon. there's cheaper... Like tiers along that premium plan, so sixteen dollars. All right, hold on, maybe I'm wrong. Well, no, it's like oh, sixteen for a year. Sorry, sixteen right. for a year, and then like the cheaper plans are like you know three dollars for a month. Right, and then the basic plan is free if you want to just have the basic options for Pokemon Home. Yeah, you're right. You know, which you know seems like a decent offering, right? Being being able to store thirty thirty yeah. Pokemon. If you're the kind of person nothing. who has that many Pokemon, you're probably not. You're probably like eh, sixteen dollars a year is probably fine. It's just this comes at a bad time where people are already kind of like not happy with Game Freak yeah. and kind of feel like they're, like, w- it's kind of the double whammy of the game and the DLC, and the people who are pissed about both of those things are going to be pissed about this, too. Yeah, which makes sense. Right. Mr. Mitch George writes in and says, good day, bless Ron, which I kind of like that. Bless Ron. Mm. It sounds like almost like a Dragon Ball Z kind of Omega Shenron bless type Ron. deal. Yeah, I yeah. Like, I'm digging it. Is there enough being offered in Pokemon Home to justify the price increase from Pokemon Bank? With the addition of GTS Wonder Trades challenges as well as ongoing server costs there's a lot more going on in home versus bank i know the internet is going to immediately react poorly to this price without giving the service a chance thanks for all you do um mr mitch george this is an interesting one because one i'm 
to be honest, I don't know much about GTS and Wonder Trades and all these specific features. I don't know if Tim could be could be the guy who kind of informs us here. So GTS, I was that thing in older Pokemon, or not older, but like DS on Pokemon games where you could put a Pokemon in a box and say, "I want X thing. I want. I'm going to put this Chikorita in a box, and you give me a Qrim, mm-hmm. like, and." If somebody had a Q-Rim and they wanted to trade for Chikorita, they could just put it in there, too. It's basically like OK Cupid for Pokemon. Oh, wow. I like it. That's all you had to tell me. <laughs> so they took that out of the newest game. Mm-hmm. But now it's in Pokemon Home, which immediately kind of like, like, why did you take it out of the new game if you're going to put it in here? But the free service will let you do it the same way you do it in the game, where you just do one at a time. If you want to do more than one at a time, then you pay for it. So I guess in that sense, it makes sense. Like, I could see why they did that. Again, it's if it's not a thing that you think is worth the money, I don't think you should pay for it. Mm-hmm. I think it this doesn't give numbers, right? Like, of what the actual things, like, what's the upper limit on deposits you can make, right? Mm-hmm. For basic? For basic, I mean, in terms of, like, Pokemon that can be deposited, it's 30. 30, okay. Yes. At any one time, or can you, like, put them in there, transfer, and then come back? Like, oh, I don't know. I assume it's, like, 30 that... It can hold, right? I that's imagine. what I would assume too. Yeah. I, again, that's a thing that like I think changes the calculus of this a bit. Because mm-hmm. like if you can do all this stuff for free, like I don't think you really need to pay for premium unless you're like a Pokemon Power user. Yeah. And six thousand for premium seems like seems like a decent number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. But yeah, like I th- I think it's like what you said. It's kind of what you're willing to pay for. You know, like if you don't want it, you kind of. Yeah can just not get it or just use basic yeah or like obviously it depends it's for you what your calculus on it is like today the second fighter pass for smash is on sale like mm. you can buy it starting today i think when the byleth update comes out but why would you unless you're just so sure you know every ca- you're going to love every character or you're going you're going to be happy with whatever they choose mm-hmm. like wait until they at least announce one character yeah, and it's like for me personally, like I'd be the kind of person who usually buys Fighter Pass un- sight unseen. So for me, th- I know that I'll probably like everything they put. But for anyone else, I don't think the calculus makes a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like are you invested enough in Pokemon to give Pokemon Home a shot? No, I I yeah. played I played that game. I didn't even finish the Pokedex, or I fi- like just finished the main story and the post story. And like, all right, I'm done. Yeah. If this were, if this online infrastructure ad- existed when I was in high school and I was playing Pokemon Ruby for 600 hours, mm-hmm. then yes, I would absolutely have paid money to transfer that entire completed Pokedex that took me forever onto the next game. But there was like a different thing where you put a GBA card into a DS game, and I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm tired. So yeah. I got off the wagon there, and I'm never getting back on the wagon, and I'm never going to have to do something like this again. But if you are someone who's constantly still on that wagon, and you do love Pokemon, you do love that IP, and like you love your completed collection, I think it would be smart. You can, with the fact that the GB or Game Boy games are on the 3DS, you can technically go from the very first generation and make a team that goes all the way to the end. Theoretically. Mm. But if you wanted to do that, if you wanted, wait, actually, wait, no, because you couldn't do the DS games. Could, well. I I have to think on that. Maybe someone you got us all excited for nothing. Maybe someone a year wrong can tell me, but I know those early games you can definitely use Pokemon Bank for. Wait, for, wait, like the DS era, no, or so like all the way from the beginning? DS? The virtual virtual console on 3DS. Gotcha. They have okay. the G- Game Boy Pokemon games. Okay, and, and you, those could support Pokemon Bank. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Interesting, and yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat as you, where I played Pokemon Sword, beat it. And kind of had my time with it, and yeah, this isn't something that I necessarily be looking forward to. So I feel I, so I feel like this is something that's for the more hardcore Pokemon fans, and for them, you know, I feel like it is a situation where it is like speak with your wallet if you want it, you know, get it, or if this feels like it's a value to you, mm-hmm. go for it. But if it's not, you know, like don't get it, and maybe you'll you'll see the the price go down, you know, if it seems like it's too much of a cost. Number two. A Witcher spin-off game is now available on Nintendo Switch worldwide. This is from Francesco DeMeo of WCCF Tech. Thronebreaker The Witcher Tales received a surprise release on Nintendo Switch eShop today. The game's Nintendo Switch release, which has been rated in Korea last month, did not receive any prior announcement, so no one was expecting expecting it 
coming so soon on the console. The game is now available worldwide on the eShop and requires four gigabytes of free storage space. Quote, Thronebreaker is a single-player role-playing game set in the world of The Witcher that combines narrative-driven exploration with unique puzzles and card battle mechanics. Crafted by the de developers responsible for some of the most iconic moments in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, the game spins a truly regal tale of Meeve, a war veteran and queen of two northern realms, Lyria and Rivia. Facing an imminent Nilfgaardian invasion, Meeve is forced to once again enter the warpath and set out and set out on a dark journey of destruction and revenge. That's pretty exciting, a new Witcher game. Yeah, I mean, so it's new in that it's coming to Switch for the first time, mm -hmm. but it has been on PC and I want to say other consoles for a while. Wait, really? Yes. So Gwent and Thronebreaker were ported to PS4 and Xbox One. Um, I'm trying to look up the exact date, but I believe it was 2018. Really? Because I knew about Gwent. I didn't know yeah. about Thronebreaker. And then Gwent, they announced the cessation of like services for that on consoles. I think it ends summer 2020, but they announced it last year. I don't know. He lied to us about the Pokemon. I did he lie did to, lie to us about the Pokemon. You can't believe anything I'm saying. <laughs> but yeah, Thronebreaker is the single player version of Gwent. Okay. So it's a full full ass Witcher story, just within like a smaller like scale card game thing. Mm -hmm. Does this do Does this do anything for you? Mm, I might play it. I never played Thronebreaker, so I now is a probably a decent time to. Go do it unless it's on sale on Steam or something. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I feel like the the idea of having this portable, you know, being a uh, uh, it's a card game, right? It's a card yes. game. Yeah, it, being a portable card game, I feel like does does a lot for me. One of the reasons why I didn't get into Gwent as a standalone game, even though I loved Gwent in The Witcher Three, was the fact that it's it seemed like there, there was the level of investment that I wasn't willing to put. Yeah, in, no, that was you know, just for that game. That was ultimately people's problems with Gwent was it was. Like, Triple Triad, if you made that its own game, I don't think it would, you know, Triple Triad, the Final Fantasy VIII card game. Okay. If you made that its own game, I don't think it would stand on its own, because I believe it exists as part of that game, and part of the coolness factor of it is it being attached to this other thing. Mm -hmm. Gwent wasn't right for expansion. Like, it was a really cool thing within Witcher 3, and it was cool I could basically challenge anyone as part of my Witcher quest to a card game, but it didn't necessarily need to be its own Hearthstone, yeah. you know? It's weird, because as I was playing Witcher 3... I wanted them to make, you know, their own Gwent game. Right. Because that's how I played. I played Witcher 3 with the with the idea in my mind that, like, oh, no, this, I'm not actually playing Witcher 3. I am playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 1, where I'm on Duelist <laughs> Kingdom, and I'm going around, and I'm just dueling people. That's kind of how I played Witcher 3, where I probably spent half my time in that game playing Gwent. Right. Um, and I loved it, and I wanted them to make a standalone Gwent. But when they did, I was kind of like, and I don't know if it's because they, they launched in early access or beta or whatever it was. Um, to where I was like, oh, I'll wait for it to finish, but there's something about it that I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily pull myself to, yeah, make that investment into it as, yeah, as a console game. But having it on Switch, I feel like, I feel like that changes the game a little bit because mm -hmm. that feels like a game. It's almost like Hearthstone, where I, I, a lot of my friends lo love to play Hearthstone on their phone, right? And I can't remember if Gwen is Gwen and Thronebreaker are available on on mobile or not, but. You know, that seems like a more ideal way to be able to play this type of game is to be able to just access it whenever you want. Yeah. And so. Yeah, Gwent, like, Thronebreaker itself, which is, I, I'm making it distinct from Gwent, is probably the middle ground people are looking for of, I don't necessarily want to play this Gwent as a competitive card game, but I would like to play just a new Witcher story that has Gwent in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That seems pretty cool. Number three, Nintendo mobile games reach $1 billion in lifetime player spending. This is by Katie Williams of Sensor Tower. Nintendo's mobile games have generated more than $1 billion in lifetime revenue from global player spending on the App Store and Google Play. Sensor Tower store intelligence data shows Nintendo's mobile re repertoire, which compromises... Compr oh, which comprises six games, has also amassed a combined 452 million downloads worldwide. The majority, $656 million, or 61% of Nintendo's mobile revenue, has come from strategy RPG Fire Emblem Heroes. The next two highest grossing Nintendo titles were Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, which has accounted for 12% of all user spending among the company's mobile games, followed by Dragalia Lost at 11%, which I forgot came out. Mm-hmm. Those familiar with the, with the company's iconic, ubiquitous plumber, Mario, may be surprised to learn that Mario Kart Tour and Super Mario Run, the latter of which had a record-breaking launch, launch day and remains Nintendo's most downloaded title, contributed smaller shares of overall revenue at 8 and 
respectively, with Dr. Mario World following with less than 1%. Nintendo was unsurprisingly most successful in its home market of Japan, where the $581 million it's earned totals 54% of its overall mobile game revenue. The U.S. has come in second with $316 million, or 29%. This distribution is reflected across all of its mobile games, with the exception of Mario Kart Tour and Super Mario Run, those whose spending skews more towards the U.S., the overall revenue distribution among Nintendo's mobile, mobile games is a stark contrast to the downloads share. Super Mario Run holds the crown with 244 million downloads, or 54% of the publisher's four, 452 million mobile game downloads, while Mario Kart Tour's 147 million installs represented 32%. Fire Emblem Heroes, Nintendo's highest grossing title, has, has only accounted for 4% of the total. Nintendo has been experimenting with various monetization strategies since it first entered the mobile market in mid-2016, while its 2016 earnings from Super Mario Run amounted to a modest $26 million. It was in February 2017, with the hugely successful launch of Fire Emblem Heroes, that Nintendo found its mobile footing. Despite being lower ranked in terms of downloads, download share, the financial success of Fire Emblem Heroes, which boasts average revenue per download of $41, suggests that Nintendo has hit upon a winning formula with the gacha model. Although it has since experimented with other methods of monetization, such as subscriptions with Mario Kart Tour and Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, Nintendo hasn't managed yet to, to replicate the same scale of financial success with its subsequent titles. It did, however, manage to earn more than $350 million from its mobile offerings in 2019, and the publisher will no doubt continue experimenting with and refining monetization models in its existing and future titles to grow that total along with new releases later in 2020. 20 imran khan Mm -hmm. how do you feel about nintendo's mobile offerings i don't think they've been good games Mm -hmm. i don't like i think the best game they've made has probably been dr mario i don't i don't even know if i like did you play dr mario Kevin? I love Dr. Mario. On until, the on mobile? Yeah, until really? it came with hmm. it, like uh, they they had this like bullshit like oh everything's covered in fog and well it's like well it's, now it's not a fun puzzle game it's a fun it's a stupid guessing game. <laughs> yeah, interesting because I I love Dr. Mario as a game. Yeah. I never played the mobile game because I saw they changed quite a bit of how it plays. Mm-hmm. So I like the I like the like what what it was mm-hmm. but uh again it lost me after like i don't know maybe the third world or something where it's oh, like they yeah. introduced this new thing and i was like ah oh, it's probably enough time was it like a like a money grab kind of thing or was it just a new mechanic that you just didn't like i felt like it was money grabby oh, yeah. yeah and yet it doesn't seem to actually have worked because they're saying less than one percent less than one percent less than one percent of a billion dollars is still like a still a lot of money <laughs> yeah yeah um not that much though <laughs> it's just like a million right yeah one percent of a billion? Yeah, right. It'd be that's like it's like at least t- 10, ten million. Yeah, is it? I, I'm. Yeah, that's like at least ten million. Yeah, I didn't right. wake you're up right. today yeah, expecting to do math. Ten, that's ten million. You're but right. They you're said right. Le- they said less than one percent, so we have no idea really within that one percent where yeah. it falls. Could be point zero zero one percent. Yeah, could be it's old. It could be five bucks that I made. We don't know. Yeah, I mean, Granite Fire Alum seems to be doing great too. Yeah, so. I did not realize. So let's. What forty dollars per user that they're talking about? Mm-hmm. That's crazy. <laughs> it's I mean, gotcha games. If they they people wouldn't keep making them if they didn't make money. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like their success in mobile? Do you, do you feel like this is something they're going to keep on doing? Right? Yes, like, do you feel like they sure. they see this as a core strat as a core strategy or as one of their core strategies now? I mean, core strategy implies some things, but like, mm-hmm. I think they. I don't think they know exactly what's going like. Dragalia Lost is a thing where there were reports about how that game could be more successful. It's just they're holding Psy Games back. Mm-hmm. Because Psy Games itself, were, they were c- complaining about how Nintendo is stopping them from doing some of the more monetarily offensive things they could do with that game to draw more money out of people. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think they're going to probably take a long look at what they're doing because Dr. Mario didn't do well and didn't sound like Mario Kart t- Tour did all that great. So... Which is interesting, right? The Mario games are the ones that aren't yeah. necessarily which, blowing up. Which means it's probably not like recognition that's getting like the main thing. Because Fire Emblem, as like more popular as that series is becoming, it's still kind of a niche title. Like a couple of million is nothing compared to like the, let's say, five to six hundred million Mario games have sold at this point. Mm-hmm. 
It is a big number. Yeah, which actually we'll probably get a more official number th- later this week. But it's if Mario wasn't selling that well and Fire Emblem is, then they need to re- re- go back and figure out, okay, so it's not about just putting our IPs on the system and those IPs selling well. Mm-hmm. It's about there's a certain game design philosophy that appeals to people who are on mobile that draws more money out of them. Yeah. Do you feel like we start to see more game, more of their games fall in line with how they monetized Fire Emblem? Then with the with the gotcha model. No, I think as long as they have the gotcha model, then they don't need to do that. Like I, I'm willing to bet Animal Crossing New Horizons is not going to have anything similar to Pocket Camp in terms of you need to pay for X number of things mm-hmm. or you can only do this much stuff with your effort and pay for more. I think it'll probably be now that they have that separation, they're comfortable keeping that big dividing line between the two. Mm. Like oh, you're talking about like console to yeah mobile in well, terms of other mobile games. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. They're, okay. Like, yeah, there, there'll be more like Fire Emblem and Pocket Camp for sure. Yeah, which I feel like is kind of, I don't know if I want to say it's unfortunate because it seems like this, this whole thing has just been them trying to figure out what works. And they, they tried doing the thing where uh, they put out their games for a premium price, right? Mm-hmm. But that's just Mario Run, yeah. yeah, with Mario Run. And that seems to not have worked as well for them. I remember I was reporting on some story about Mario Run when it first came out, and I talked to someone who was like, oh, yeah. People who play mobile games think Mario Run is act- are anti-consumer, which is wild. Right? Because like it is, get like pay ten bucks down and then you get the game. And everyone's like, well, I don't want to pay ten bucks down. I just want to try the game for as long as I want to and put in money into a tip jar because that's the way the market works. Gosh, it's 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 so interesting how different mobile is from from console. Mm-hmm. And it's ca- it's kind of weird seeing Nintendo, you know, finding success in this way and seeming to. I mean, I'm. Like we said, right, they're probably going to p- pivot their mobile strategy entirely to be like this gotcha model sort of deal because that's where they found success. But it it also, for some reason, kind of hurts to see their franchises turned into this, even though it's separate from console, even though, mm. like, it's not really affecting me as much as a console player. Yeah. You know, somebody who doesn't really mess with mobile all that much. But still weird to see. I mean, it's interesting because, like, when the, the mobile thing was first announced, it was done by Satoru Iwata he was saying the main idea is we just want to take our IPs, put them on mobile, and use that as I- advertisement for bigger games. Mm-hmm. So, like, like a hypothetical example is let's make a Kid Icarus game for mobile, and then people play that and go, like, hey, Kid Icarus is kind of cool, and then buy the 3DS game. Hmm. But then they decided to go fully into it, and Furukawa is much more of a businessman and looking at profit. Mm-hmm. Not, I, that's not meant to be an insult. That's kind of his job as a president yeah. of Nintendo. And he's looking at, okay, okay how can we make money off mobile? Because every four else is. Like, why do we not make as much money as everyone else? And the answer is we need to start designing games for that audience. Mm-hmm. And that's probably what they're going to start doing from here on out. Well, congratulations to those numbers. Those <laughs> A are, billion dollars is nothing to sneeze yeah, at. Yeah, that's nothing to sneeze at. Number four, did Respawn just murder the new Apex Legends guy? This is from Austin Goslin from Polygon. And I was, freaking about, I was freaking out about this on yesterday's episode because Greg was reading the ad as I was discovering this news. And I think Corey Cudney clipped out a great gif of me go- looking at my laptop and going like, what the fuck? <laughs> because I, I was shocked by what I was seeing. And so we talked, about, we talked a bit about this yesterday, but I want to bring it up in an official capacity mm. today. Last week, Apex Legends developer Respawn Entertainment introduced the world to Forge, the newest legend to enter the Apex games. But in the game's latest trailer, which Respawn released on Monday morning, Forge was murdered dur- during a live interview. The culprit, the mysterious and frequently leaked robot, probably known as Revenant. The trailer starts out like a standard introduction. The championship winning MMA fighter Forge introduces himself and talks a big game about how how well he'll do in the Apex Legends fictional combat sport, the Apex Games. Suddenly, the lights flicker and a robotic figure robotic figure appears behind Forge. The new robot morphs its hand into a blade and stabs Forge, ending the champion's run and probably his chance at joining the Apex Games. The reveal, this reveal is simultaneously shocking and a little expected. On the one hand, when Respawn announced Forge would be the next character added to to Apex Legends, there wasn't much reason to doubt the developer, and no reason to think he'd he'd be murdered in a trailer. What isn't surprising, however, is the assassin in question. While we haven't been formally introduced to this new robot, frequent leaks, which started appearing in October, have led most had led most of the the community to believe that this is Revenant. The description of the trailer on the Apex Legends website also says that it introduces us to to a mysterious new champion. So this robot entering the game seems like a pretty safe bet. 
while Respawn hasn't officially confirmed that Revenant will be taking, a for taking Forge's spot in the Apex games, it's worth noting that Forge's picture is now grayed out on the Apex Legends Season 4 website. His name has also been changed to R.I.P. Jimmy Forge McCormick with a description that reads, never defeated except for that one time, which isn't a good sign. <laughs> so this is awesome because I, I mentioned this yesterday, right? Last week... There was the Apex Dev stream that happened, and it happened. It started as soon as we started, like I think it was Thursday's episode of KFGD, and so we we're kind of on the lookout for Apex news as we we're doing the show. And as the Apex news started to come out, I like looked through it, and Greg like asked me for my thoughts, and I was like, "This seems like pretty cool, like you know, a new legend in Forge, and like the standard kind of like okay, yeah, uh, updates on ranked and a new weapon." Okay, cool. Like, I wasn't necessarily blown away by any means. Yeah. It's probably the least blown away I've been with one of their season reveals. I saw how people were disappointed. Like, oh, they revealed Forge and there wasn't a cool CG trailer or anything. It's just like, oh, yeah, here's our new guy. Yeah. Like, and I was like, okay. It's like, I guess, cool. like, as, if you're running a game to the service, sometimes your budget runs out and you just got to like roll just, with yeah. Yeah. Guys, it was a fake out. Yeah, you just got to do the new fake season out. and not, like, have a big blow up with it. And, like, I mean, it also wasn't that impressive because the Forge was. Forge's description was basically just Doomfist from Overwatch, and so yeah. I was like, "All right, cool." You know, I'm not like I'm not mad at it, but you know, this doesn't this isn't as crazy as the season yeah, three reveal. It seemed kind of lame, honestly. Yeah, and but. so for this to happen yesterday, where they put out a new CG trailer, and it's literally Forge getting murdered, <laughs> yes, and like blood splattered on like the 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 interviewer's face, right, and th them freaking out and everything like going crazy. I think it was one of the coolest things they've done with Apex Legends, like yeah. today. That's that is all. Honestly, a cool twist, and I kind of wonder, like, I'm not much of a wrestling fan these days. I was when I was a kid, not mm -hmm. so much anymore, but it feels like one of those wrestling-style writing things. Yeah. No, it feels like, you know, Shawn Michaels betraying, like, Triple H, or, yeah. like, you know, like, something unexpected happening. Or, like, or like you're trying to get someone over so hard, Yeah. and then suddenly, like, Sting comes down from the rafters and hits him with a baseball bat. Exactly. Like, that's their power establishment section and like oh that was a super cool way to actually reveal someone it's like that sort of way yeah also sidebar this has nothing to do with anything uh on the during the royal rumble edge if you're familiar with wwe or wwf right mm -hmm. edge came out during the royal rumble and legit i saw clips on twitter i had never gotten goosebumps like that before <laughs> it was, that was pretty, the coolest it was thing rad. it was pretty rad. yeah because you all you hear like you it's the royal rumble right so you see people in the ring wrestling and then you hear edge's music because the countdown went to one right and at first i'll like Watching the clip, I was like, I recognize that, right? And when it when you realize this edge, you're like, oh, dude, let's freaking go. That's really cool. <laughs> it's been like eight years. It's dope. Um, but yeah, this is like a cool thing. I really like it. Uh, I wonder if it's. I wonder if it's gonna be two legends or like if Forge is just never gonna come out because I feel like that's a that's like a that's a ballsy thing to do to reveal a legend and then be like, actually no, you know that was a joke. He's not coming out. What if he comes out end of the season? As like a robot type thing, or like a cyborg oh, edge, or like coming back from the zombie dead. edge, or something like that, or zombie forge, or forge. Yeah, yeah sorry, zombie edge would also be cool. <laughs> That's how he should have been introduced in <laughs> yeah, Royal Rumble. In Royal Rumble, uh, that would be really cool too. I wonder what they're gonna do because I feel like, and I, I don't know if there's gonna be anybody who's like truly upset, but I feel like you run that risk, right? When you reveal somebody and be like, no, nah, this they aren't coming out. I feel like you run the risk of people being like, oh, but. That guy was really cool. Well, you had to purposely design, like, a lame character for that to work, right? Yeah. Like, if you introduced, like, let's use the Overwatch example. If you introduced Sombra, and people were like, okay, cool. Like, a Hispanic, like, hacker woman character. This is cool. Yeah. And then you kill her off to put in Doomfist. Like, then, yeah, yeah, then you're like, everybody's like, dude, what? Like, Sombra looked dope. Yeah. So, so you have to design that. someone, like, a little generic and, like, not that much, like, pomp and circumstance to the reveal. Mm -hmm. And then you got to, like, then you cut it off. Yeah. Which I think makes sense, and once again, very ballsy move. I respect it, and I love it. I played Apex yesterday, just just cause, you know, just cause I was hyped from this. Do you think we're gonna get a new battle royale this year, like in anything? Because it seems like wasn't Ubisoft working on a battle royale game, or was that just was that just like people speculating? I don't recall. One. I feel like when PUBG and, and stuff started to get big. I feel like multiple big companies started talking about battle royales, but I feel like Ubisoft might have been one of them. But that might have just been something that. I made up in my head. Right. We haven't had like a big, because one year it was PUBG, then Fortnite, yeah. then Apex. Like PUBG was like 2017, then the end of 2017, going into 2018, Fortnite blew up, right? And then, yeah, last year was Apex. I imagine we'll get some sort of, there has to be. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be some sort of big Battle Royale announcement. Whether or not whatever game that is catches fire and is successful, I think is another thing. But 
going into the new generation of consoles, I feel like you kind of have a chance to kind of cement yourself as like, oh, we're the big battle royale game on the PS5 and Xbox Series X. I feel like that that is going to be an angle for like one or two announcements. Here's my hope. Mm-hmm. I know it's never going to happen, but I hope that Splatoon game they're teasing is a battle royale. Oh my Think god! Think about how much cool cooler that game would be as a battle royale because like, you could actually see where people have been fighting because they paint on the ground. That'd be pretty dope. Or you I could just, like that freak people out or like convince them there's stuff somewhere else or a place has already been looted because you've been painting around it. Mm-hmm. That'd be pretty dope. And I think like I think there's a chance for more smaller battle royales to get announced and like you know be successful too. Like I'm playing Darwin Project, which yeah. I talked about on PS I Love You. It's like a ten person. Yeah, it's like a yeah. ten person battle royale. It's like the focus is more so on like survival and keeping your temperature up and like tracking players because you can see kind of like what you're saying just then right you can kind of see where players have been mm-hmm. because uh, players will cut down trees and gain resources and you can look to where the players have cut down and then track where they have been which is pretty cool but i think we'll see more like unique novel concepts within the genre like that and so like i'm i'm looking forward to whatever is whatever is announced in battle royale because like i feel like there's there's still a lot of potential like Apex for me was mind blowing because of how many leaps and bounds they made in the genre as far as like the ping system and like how good it feels mechanically and like the um, like discovering a new area and how the name pops up on screen of the new of the of an area with like the the loot tier and all that yeah. stuff like there are so many different features they've they implemented in Apex off the bat that I thought like wow I can believe I I couldn't believe how far battle royale had come within just like one game that I I'm sure there will yeah. be others that try and elevate things more yeah i'm excited to see what new ideas people come up with that fortnite then takes yeah for sure (laughs) for sure number five resident evil 8 maybe first person again this is from nathan birch of wccf tech recently we brought you some new rumors about resident evil 8 specifically that development had been rebooted at some point and the finished game was probably years away well apparently capcom just can't keep a lid on re8 because another set of of more specific rumors about the game's story and features have begun making the rounds these rumors come courtesy of biohazard declassified which received an email from a person with an address an address similar to someone who accurately leaked re details in the past noted insider nibel has also vouched for the information shout out to nibel man i know him it's hilarious that people call him noted insider (laughs) he would find it hilarious too yeah because he just like posts things that other people post right that said as always you should take all these rumors with a grain of salt it sounds like resident evil 8 will be a fairly direct sequel to resident evil 7 with both ethan winters and chris redfield returning in some capacity First person style gameplay will return, but the settling but the setting will be new, with players apparently beginning the game in a European style village, then making their way toward a castle, passing through snowy, mountainous environments on the way. Traditional zombies will return as opposed to the molded from RE7, and players will also face wolf like enemies and a re- reoccurring shadowy female shaped entity that will dissolve but not die permanently if shot. That sounds like a like Mr. X kind of. Yeah, and also sounds like some ideas they were throwing around for Resident Evil 4 originally. Yeah. Apparently, these de- details are from a test of RE8 held last year, while the r- previous rumors claimed the current version of the game only started development about six months ago. So, we shall see. Imran, mm-hmm. how do you feel about these rumors? Do you feel like there's any validity here? I, I could believe it. This kind of sounds like where they wanted to take the Resident Evil uh, franchise for a while. I definitely think they want to do more with Ethan. So it makes sense they bring him back again. Mm -hmm. Because, like, there was a lot of leftover questions at the end of Resident Evil 7 of, like, wait, is Ethan exactly who he says he is? Or what's the deal with Chris Redfield and Blue Umbrella? To the point where, like, they released a DLC. They, like, announced DLC about Chris Redfield and then delayed it, like, a year. And then it ended up coming, like, towards the very end of 2017. Mm -hmm. But I, I think... Capcom was very reactive about Resident Evil, and they often change things based on the criticisms people had. And that sounds like things like it's one of those things where it's hard to tell if it's like a rumor or a wish list or whatever. Mm-hmm. But this sounds like the kind of thing they would do. Of okay, yeah, we've heard what your problems were with that game. We're gonna still stick with our ideas with it, but we're going to like try and fix some of those things. Is it surprising to you at all that they might do first person again after RE Seven? Because I feel like with RE7 being, like, the last, like, numbered entry mm-hmm. in Resident Evil, but then, like, RE2 coming out and being super su- successful and us about to get RE3, right? And both of those games being, 
kind of alternating, you know, RE7 being first person more along the lines of what this rumor is saying, and then RE2 being going back to the like the classic third person kind of gameplay, and RE3 about to be doing that again. But seeing success in, success in RE2 and how well it kind of will like vibes with a modern audience, mm -hmm. is it surprising that they would do first person again? No, RE7 sold really well. Like mm -hmm. it sold. People think that RE2 sold that much better, but they're pretty much on par. Mm -hmm. And I could see like them wanting to like. Let's say you do make RE8 a game that looks like Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3, then you run the risk of what happened to Resident Evil 4 or Resident Evil B4 of saturating the market. And now they have like this alternate thing that they can occasionally go back to and try different ideas with of okay so you have your remakes but now you also have this new like newish thing that is different and th i think we always kind of forget that resident evil 7 is probably like the best selling survival horror game in like i think ever in terms really? of like actual survival horror not necessarily action mm -hmm. so if they w want to like have those two alternate paths like they used to have with say monster hunter where there was like the more limited portable game which sold better and like the more ambitious console games that didn't sell as well, Capcom has done this kind of thing before. And I think it makes total sense for them to do it with Resident Evil as well. Interesting. Do you think they go back to third person at a certain point? Like, say this say this next one is first person. Mm -hmm. Do you think Resident Evil 9 goes back to third person? Or do you feel like they're pretty... Like, do you feel like this is the new direction of Resident Evil for now on? I think they would like to keep these parallel lines as long as they can. Mm. But if they... If it doesn't succeed... Like, there mm. was a... Negoshi, who was Sega and Yakuza, which is a different thing, but when Yakuza 7 revealed that they had a turn-based system, and his Negoshi just said, like, yeah, if people hate it, we'll just go back. Like, it's yeah. not a thing that we'll, we're that committed to. I think this is the same thing for pretty much any long-running series, that if people hate this new change, if Resident Evil 8 doesn't sell, then they'll go back and make third-person ones again. Yeah. But for now, they are make they have a parallel line of remakes now. They've done two. They'll, they're doing three. Do you think they'll do four? I think so. I'd like I, that. I don't know that they'll do four next. Mm -hmm. Like there are other games that are possible. Like they could re remake one. They could do Code Veronica X. But four, I think, makes a it makes a certain amount of logical sense because people forget how old that game is at this point. Yeah, where it's been over fifteen years. No, yeah, it would have well, been over fifteen years last week. Oh, really? Okay. Did that game come out in two thousand five, two thousand four? I'm looking this up. I, I want to say two thousand. Okay, maybe you're wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I. 2005 sounds right. I think I just did the math wrong. I think I, I, think I did the math wrong on that one. It was no, definitely not the date. 2005. January, yes. January 11th, 2005. So, so it, right. it will be 15 years. 15 not. years. Yes. That's wild. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah Resident Evil is a very interesting franchise. because Resident Evil 2 Remake was the first one I beat. Resident Evil 4, I tried playing, but I couldn't get super into it because I tried playing it like after playing games like Last of Us and games that I feel like have kind of taken that formula and kind of modernized it a bit. Mm -hmm. So going back to it and feeling like the controls of it, I did I, I never really could click with it. But I'm down for a remake of it. I'll, I'd love to play a remake. But Resident Evil is an interesting franchise because what it started off as like a top-down, like, you know, classic kind of survival horror game, shifted into being more behind the back, then went very action-y, and then went first person. And it does feel like it does feel like Resident Evil can really do whatever they want and it'll still fit with the franchise as long as it is horror at the core of it and zombies right right and so like i'm i'm curious to see what they what they do next if this rumor is true like you know i'm i'm curious to see like what people like demand from the future of resident evil after this game yeah it's kind of like that thing we were talking about a couple of weeks ago with like 15 years ago they were already saying oh resident evil has gotten stale we need to change it up again yeah and that was 15 years ago it's so wild. like long running series you have to do that kind of thing and i guess we're going to see like if that same the same thing is true for the future of Resident Evil as well. Imran, I'm very excited to see what they do with Resident Evil 8. But the release, release of that game and the announcement is probably so far away. If I want to know what's coming out to Mom and Grab Shops today, where would I look? The official list of upcoming software across each and every platform is listed by the Kind of Funny Game Daily Show host each and every weekday. Do, 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 Yeah! Out today, we have Thronebreaker, The Witcher Tales, now being available on Nintendo Switch. Warcraft 3 Reforged for PC and Mac, Kentucky Route Zero TV Edition for PS4, Xbox One, and Switch, Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire for PS4 and Xbox One, The Coma 2 Vicious Sisters for PC, Journey to the Savage Planet for PS4, Xbox One, and PC, DCL The Game for PC, 
Actual Sunlight for Switch, <laughs> Box Kid Adventures for PC, Effie for PC, Mommy for PC, <laughs> <laughs> Warhammer Underworlds Online for PC, and the new dates. Battlefield 5 continues its foray into the Pacific as DICE Today reveals new details surrounding Chapter 6, Into the Jungle. This next chapter in Battlefield 5's Tides of War uh, campaign will launch on Thursday, February 6th. Shadowgun War Games, the FPS with intense hero-driven 5v5 battles, is locked and loaded for battle on iOS and Android starting February 12th. On January 30th, the Tetris 99 11th Maximus Cup online event begins for all players with a, te- with a Nintendo Switch online membership. The event runs from 11 p.m. Pacific Time on January 30th and ends at 10.59 p.m. Pacific Time on February 3rd. To participate, Nintendo, Nintendo Switch online members just have to play the Tetris 99 online mode during the contest period. Points will be awarded based on placements during each match, and at the end of the, the event, the, the top 999 players with the most accumulated event points will win, will each win 999 gold points that can be used to help purchase games in Nintendo eShop, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Actually, I didn't know that was a thing. If I were any good at Tetris, I would do that. And then this comes from a press release. Both GTA Online and Red Dead Online had a record-breaking holiday season with achievements including the highest player numbers in GTA Online ever following the the December launch of the Diamond Casino Heist, which set a new high in player numbers. Uh, Red Dead Online hit a new peak in player numbers in December following the release of the Moonshiners update, topping those numbers again in January. And then GTA 5's biggest year ever for views on YouTube, with December 30th to January 5th being the biggest seven-day period ever, along with a new record for engagement via likes and comments in the week ending in January 12th. To celebrate these milestones, we will be offering huge bonuses in games. GTA Online will feature bonus cash up to, to two million GTA dollars in its biggest cash giveaway yet, which is awesome. I'm gonna be <laughs> logging <laughs> off for that. Starting on January 30th, you can earn one million GTA dollars just by playing before February 5th, and we'll be able to earn another G- uh, a million GTA dollars by playing between J- February 6th and February 12th. Red Dead Online players will receive a series of gifts, including free access to select roles, special role item giveaways, and more, including the Gunsley. Gunslinger's cash, cache, cash. I'm gonna say cash. Cache, but cache. either way, I honestly pronounce it either way. Very good. Play between January 28th and February 3rd to get a free Schofield revolver. Uh, I'm sure there's a relation to Max somewhere in there. A free varmint rifle and the de- the devastating ammo bundle, which includes a hundred times split point revolver ammo, a hundred times high velocity high velocity pistol ammo, a hundred times express repeater ammo, and a hundred slug shotgun ammo, and twenty explosive rifle ammo and then lastly the bounty hunters kit play between february 4th and february 10th to get a reward for a free bounty hunter license 25 bolas and 25 tracking arrows so if you're a fan of gta online or red dead online jump on those because those are all available for you for free now it's time for reader mail you can write into patreon.com slash kind of funny games where you can get the show ad free and speaking of ads this episode of kind of funny games daily is brought to you by G.I. Joe, War on Cobra. <clears throat> Yo, Joe, G.I. Joe and Cobra are back in G.I. Joe, War on Cobra. Will you join the Joes and fight for justice, or will you seek world domination with Cobra? The choice is yours. G.I. Joe, War on Cobra is a free download out and out now for both Android and iOS devices. Whether you're a fan of the classic animated series, the iconic toy line, comics, or all the above, G.I. Joe, War on Cobra has something for everyone. It has a massive roster featuring the most beloved and infamous heroes, villains, and vehicles featured in the series. Nick grew up wanting to be a Joe, and Greg always wanted to scream like a Cobra commander. Once you've chosen your side, players will be introduced <laughs> introduced to the game's mechanics via Roadblock for Joes or Baroness for Cobra. You'll learn how to manage your base, units, vehicles, and engage in battles to help you get a feel for managing your troops. As you continue with the single-player campaign missions, more options for reinforcing your army with additional units, heroes, and vehicles begin to open up. But that's just the beginning. G.I. Joe Warren Cobra also features PvP and ranked leaderboard. You'll need to fight hard for your faction, build out and defend your base strategically, and master the art of directing troops to conquer your foes, and in no time, you will be an expert on making attacks from air, land, and sea. While you're here, 
we have a special in-game gift from D3Go. As a token of appreciation for checking out G.I. Joe, Warren Cobra, we're giving away two free characters for all new players to help reinforce your army. Joes can look forward to picking up a free bazooka, the G.I. Joe Missile Specialist, while Cobra, Cobra followers can add Missile Bat, or Missile B-A-T, it's abbreviated, so I'm just going to say Missile B-A-T, the Battle Android Trooper, to their squad. In the meantime, don't forget that knowing is half the battle. Check out the description below or head to www.d3go.com slash kfgames to download G.I. Joe, Warren Cobra, and receive your free gift on your mobile device. Next up is Robin Hood. 2020 is the perfect time to start thinking about 2040. With Robinhood, you can you can invest in the markets and earn an interest with a competitive APY on an uninvested cash. They make it easy to get started and learn as you grow with an in intuitive app experience and no commission fees on trades. And stock prices don't have to hold you back. You can buy a piece of, of a company you love for as low as $1 and build your prof portfolio a little bit at a time. Buy one share, buy half a share, three and a quarter shares it's up to you your budget and your goals your first stock is on the house <clears throat> when you set up your account go to games.robinhood.com to learn more and claim your free stock annual percentage yield is apy on uninvested cash is paid by program banks and is variable Robinhood financial is not a bank the free stock offer is subject to terms and conditions all investments involve risks other fees may apply visit rbnhd.co slash fees the nanobiologist writes in and says, hi, Blessing and Imran. With the coronavirus spreading. <laughs> wow, this got dark fast. Okay. <laughs> that's, a way, if you, that's a great way to start a question if you want me to be, be invested from the get-go. Yeah. With the coronavirus spreading, there have been reports that games tournaments in China, and I suspect other countries soon, are getting canceled. So, do you guys have any tips for conventions or tournaments to stay clean and healthy? Are there any precautions you take so you don't catch any convention or tournament plagues? Thanks, the nanobiologist. Uh, never learn not to touch your mouth in any way. Yep. Uh, before you eat anything, like always, keep, like do the what's hand the sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. Yes. I in recent years have learned that if you're not meeting someone in professional capacity, like you, you're going to learn this too. Cause you're going to kind of funny or represent kind of funny conventions. Yeah. Don't shake hands. Like I know people mm -hmm. like want to like shake hands to people they like admire and all that stuff, but don't. Yeah. Like, I, I own the fist bump. I don't right? even like, fist bump because fist bump has the same problem. True, but elbow it's not bump. Like, elbow, Cause you're elbow never going to school. Too, you're yeah. never going to eat with your elbow. Yeah. My thing is like, you know, well. it's, <laughs> it, Kevin, do you eat with your elbow? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm never gonna do it. You know yeah. what I mean? Definitely don't. It's hard. It, it's definitely awkward because you don't want to be rude to people yes, by absolutely. rejecting a handshake. But I think people people will will 100 percent understand if you go for an elbow or if you like. I do the fist bump because I feel more secure in the fist bump than I do in the handshake for sure. Right. And so like people people will be down for that. People will understand if like. It, it, that split second of like, oh, what's he going for? And you're like, oh man, no, just this elbow about me, man. I'm trying to avoid germs. People will understand. Uh, um, definitely keep hand sanitizer. That's yes. what I do. Greg Miller does the one hand for shaking, one hand for eating. So he never uses his mm -hmm. left hand. That gets tough I, though because if you're, always, if you're touching controllers. I've also well, seen I mean, Greg Miller drink pretzels also, out of a glass. Like he's not necessarily a good but he, uh, he, he, but sort of he is. He's actually really, really. Yeah, no, he doesn't get sick. He's yeah. also just a weirdo in this sort yeah. of thing. I do get like half the packs I go to, I get sick. But um, well, I, I mean, I, I, so I've been packs box, yeah. I've been doing the one hand for shaking, one hand for eating, mm -hmm. and that usually works out. Every once in a while, I get too worked up. Somebody brings out wings that I didn't expect had wings, <laughs> and then I'll just eat it with the wrong hand because I'm not thinking. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah, good policy is wash between stuff. Always yeah. carry hand sanitizer. I would carry two bottles per convention because like you never know when you're going to run out. Honestly, no, for sure. Like hand sanitizer, I feel like is key. Wash your hands constantly. And I, I've heard there's a such thing as washing your hands too much, but I don't know anything about that. I'm um, not a doctor. I just. I, I mean, just I'm sure there's clean. a too much, but like, yeah, be be a human about it. It's not. A <laughs> yeah. Um. What is the there's a there's a drinkable like like orange fruit pack thing emergency emergency yes. yes emergency has helped me out in emergencies uh so definitely consider that but yeah just do your best to stay clean honestly like keep your hand like your hands are probably the, the number one thing 
right? Like try not to eat after you touch a controller or touch people's hands. Make sure you do some sort of cleansing, you know, preferably wash your hands, you know, like hand sanitizer after you touch a controller each time is kind of what I do. But yes. and they're it, not wiping those controllers down. No, between people. they are not. Uh, I did like headsets, one packs. Yeah, don't did, uh, don't do VR. VR at a convention. Yeah, if you can avoid it, like if oh. you if you really want to avoid sickness, that's a good way to try VR though. Avoid there, VR. It is a great way to there try is, VR. Yeah, but, but like, it's definitely like but br- you, but you're, bring you're your making own, the risk. I yeah. say bring your own sanitary equipment. You know what I mean? In, in the yeah. sense of like have wipes to be like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna not hit the lenses, but I'm gonna wipe the face part of the VR. Yeah. In the hottie old days of VR, there was I the think it was like face the f- condoms. The, well, there was a uh, packs. I think were the first packs for Oculus, where they had the Oculus uh, booth next to the bathrooms, and I remember distinctly being on an elevator of people complaining like, "Hey, I got pink eye," and other people going like, "Yeah, I got pink eye too." Oh my! And I'm god. like, I need to get the fuck out of the elevator, but oh, like, <laughs> oh my god, yeah, like and. Here's the thing. If you really want to try VR, you just got to know the risk. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're willing, if you that's the thing, right? Like I go to PAX. The way you phrase that. I go to PAX and expect <laughs> to get sick at this point. Like I don't care anymore, right? Like I I, I expect that I'm going to take the next week off from work when I go to conventions. That's just that's just what my life is now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, kind of go in now. Don't go in expecting you're going to you're going to get the coronavirus. Maybe like maybe caught like you know stay safe from that. Definitely, but definitely, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the the Pax Pox. I'm gonna get the somebody at my work once called it the nerd flu when I said when I told them I got sick after <laughs> after Pax, and I was like, funny. funny. <laughs> it works though. I wish like America had the thing Japan has of like wearing, wearing face masks. masks. Yeah, like people think it's I'm weird here, but it's like it would be it'd be great for airborne stuff. It's like, scary though. You know what I mean? you <laughs> yeah, want, you whenever you see somebody wearing a face mask, <laughs> coming out with a face mask, you're I'm like, oh, I fuck. honestly think like they're about oh. to go to surgery. Like, no, I'm like, should thought. I be wearing a face mask too? Do, do you know something that I don't know right now? <laughs> <laughs> and so, protect yourself. Mm. Protection. Elbow bumps. Always wear a condom. <laughs> Groovy Muse writes in is actually definitely wear a condom. I'm actually adding that to the thing. Yeah, do that too. Uh, whether you're yeah, having, whether you're like having sex or not, if you're just walking around, wear a condom. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. If you're if, if you're at a convention and you're banging, <laughs> protect yourself. <laughs> Wrap it up. <laughs> Groovy Muse writes in and says, "What's good, KFGD crew? According to a Stadia Stadia subreddit post, the service has now gone 41 days without a new game announcement slash release. Yeah, I read that last night. The three month subscription for Pro Founders is coming up, and I wouldn't be surprised if many of them don't renew. What's happening with Stadia? Why isn't Google cutting more?" empty checks to bring out or to bring more just more games to stadia sooner what would you change change right now to save this titanic service that's heading for an iceberg thanks so what that question doesn't mention is in that stadia post a google representative does reply I, yeah i saw that stuff. but she doesn't say anything she says we hear you we're jotting down these notes mm-hmm. we'll be sure to communicate more with you in the future it's like it's n- the future is now. <laughs> Stadia has been out for 70 days. Yeah. Like, 40 of those days have had no announcements of any kind. I can understand, you know, not wanting to work through the holidays, but goddamn, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, they really fucking this up it, so badly. I feel like the Titanic analogy isn't too far off in terms of approaching the, the renewal date for people. Mm-hmm. There might be a huge drop-off, because I can't imagine that people have been getting their money's worth off of Stadia for the first few months, right? Like... What are you really there playing? There are people who are. It. Like, when I talk about this on Twitter, there are people who come at me like, what do you expect, heaven? I'm like, no, I expect a, a good service. Like, yeah. even I, the Wii U had worse or not as bad droughts as some Stadia stuff. I uh, I actually bought it once, like, even though they had announced that, like, there wasn't going to be any games. It was the like, kind of thing that I was like, I want to be there. I want to support. Like, I really believe that you have to support the things that you want to see, like, continue. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, smart watches and, like, with technology especially. Um and it's a bummer because, like, I even now I, I'm I'm to the point where it's like, wow, that's what a colossal disappointment. And the to me the disappointment continues watching Google not react to it. Yeah, it's like weird. I, I feel like the easiest thing would be like, hey, everybody that has it for three months, guess what? Now you have it for six months. Yeah, you know. <laughs> But that should, like honestly, we've said this a lot, but the very first thing should have been, "Hey, actually, this is a beta. This is not just for sale." Uh, yeah, they a hundred percent should have, like, once they figured out shit was going wrong, they should have been like, "Haha, this is a beta." And even, and I <laughs> think <laughs> this is a beta. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. <laughs> Our bad. We fucked up. I know we Whoa. said it was for reals, but it's not. 
and we're going to extend the stuff for the people that paid. Because I do think that you guys have to keep the consumer happy, and I don't think that they're... Yeah. It doesn't seem like they're taking care of that at all, and it's it's shocking to me. Yeah, like, that. the free games for next month are Guilt, which... Presumably, if you sign up for Stadia early on, you probably own Guilt, because it's the only original game on the service. Yeah. And Metro, which is also just a game on the service already, which I know... They what they should do because it's a new platform without a whole lot of internal development. They should make every free every free month have at least one new game, like a game that's new to the servers that people are not likely to have owned already. Do you feel like that's possible though? Like, like not actually a new game, like new for everyone. Yeah, I mean new like like a game that's coming freshly onto the service. Yeah, not something that's already in the store. Hmm. But I, just, I, I feel I, like I, then I, you kind of decentivize um, developers kind of p- to put their game. On the like, if they're well, if Google should be paying a check. Google's paying. Oh, them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, I mm-hmm. I feel like one of the the biggest issues I'm having is that like anytime I play it, it looks like crap. Mm. Like you know, I have it set up with the uh, Chromecast Ultra with an Ethernet cable going into it, and it doesn't look good. I've never been like, wow, this is impressive quality. Like the compression on it is just too it's intense. Pretty bad. And, yeah, and yeah. it's like that's what we're like. That's one of the benefits we're paying for for that that three month. Of, of having that 4K, but it's, I don't see it. Yeah, and like, they're, they still haven't actually done 4K support yet, right? Have they not? See, I'm totally out of I the I mean, I stadium, think that what's happening like is they're like, 4K, it's 4K capable, the games aren't being... Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so it's they one of those things where it's like, all right, well, you guys should push taking advantage of the developers the to oh, do Oh, yeah, because they did like, didn't they throw developers under the bus? Yeah, yeah, they're like, we can do 4K, just the developers aren't doing it. Which, to some degree, is a decent argument, but also it's your platform. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The developers aren't doing it because your platform isn't, like, popular. <laughs> like, why dedicate money and time into making sure this works? I mean, theoretically, like, the problem is these are not just simple PC ports, which is part of the problem right. with Stadia in the first place. And it should have been a simple thing for developers to put games on there. But, like, when Mortal Kombat launched, it launched with the crypt broken. Yeah, I saw that. And, like, how which, are you... How do you do that? Shouldn't this just be a like? It should have just been a PC port, not a weird Vulcan Linux thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Even now, we can't use the the controller for anything but the TV unless it's connected via yeah uh, USB C to USB C to your phone. They haven't done the Wi Fi thing for the controller yet, which is it, crazy. Because like it's fun because I I have multiple Chromecast uh, uh, Ultras in my house, so it's really fun to switch from one TV to another, and it is fairly seamless where it's like i go on my phone uh, switch the where i'm sending it to mm-hmm. and then it's just a command that like a prompt that's on the screen that i put into the controller and it switches over and it's like that's cool but like i feel like now we've gotten to the point where it's like if my phone's on the same wi-fi how like why don't you why can't you guys figure out a way to make that work where it's like i don't even i'm not even saying i want that to work when i'm not like at why like at a Wi-Fi point, mm-hmm. you know? I just it's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I like that's the kind of thing. It's all just kind of ridiculous. Like there, I can understand people liking Google Stadia. Like I'm not sure I necessarily it's a agree, cool but like concept. yeah. But I also think that you also have to agree they've been completely incommunicative and they've we're coming up on a year since the announcement and they've not hit most of the milestones. Yeah, they've not really fulfilled that promise. It seems like why isn't Google cutting more empty checks to bring more games to Stadia sooner? That's a good question. I think they assume their internal development. You know what? I was thinking about this today. Mm-hmm. We we talked about this in the What's Out Today. Yeah. Journey to the Savage Planet. Out today. It's getting good reviews. Google owns that developer. That yeah. game is not out on Stadia. Is that is it is it really not? No. I not as far as I know. Maybe I, maybe this is a Pokemon thing and I'm super rock again. Mm-hmm. But as far as I know, that game oh, is not out on Stadia today. Again. <laughs> but like they're not even crowing about the fact that they own a developer that's doing really, really good reviews. Or getting a game Sorry, what really game good. is it? Uh, Journey, Journey to the, the Savage Planet. Planet. Oh, okay. That one looks cool. It's a weird thing, man. And I think it's, it's them not necessarily having experience in this space. Right? I think it's they should have waited longer then. Is them still trying to a- adapt? Or like, but that was the thing, though. Like, remember <laughs> the announcement when the president of Google came out? I was like, I don't know much about video games. We yeah. got someone who does. And it's like, here's uh-huh. Phil Harrison. And he's going to do all... He's going to... Take us to the next level. And it's like, has Harrison just been napping for the last year? Like, what's happening, really? Yeah, it's... Poor guy's probably running around trying <laughs> to fix all of them. Like, you know? Yeah. Get, like, they know what these issues are. It's just shocking to me that they're not addressing them. Right. It's... it's. 
I know big companies have a hard time moving a big ship, but they should also have the resources to be able to do it. Yeah. They shouldn't charge if they can't fix things. Absolutely, that's that too. Yeah, I think the uh, to me, I think the biggest issue is what kind of what you were saying before, Kevin, is that they didn't launch an early access. I feel like they could have gotten around a lot of the criticism. And if I feel they like it was clear to access. everyone, clear to everyone, once the like big reports started coming out. I'm like, hey, these are the games that are coming out. That like things aren't going to be like smooth. Yeah. yeah, they made a list of a hundred titles at the beginning of November, and I don't think any are. I don't think the vast majority of them have come out. Man, we'll see, man. We'll see where they're, where they're at. Like, I'm sure once they approach this real day, I'm sure we'll see a big drop off. But I don't know if that's. I don't think that's the death of Google Stadia. That drop off. No, I think not. they can no, still no, they can God still no. rebuild. They can rebuild, and I think that the entire point was this is probably actually a beta. You're just not calling it one. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, right here, the people that are going to drop off are the biggest loud, like supporters that were ready to like, sh- like pull out their wallet and mm-hmm. yeah, you know, stand behind it. And those were the people that were going to get everyone else to start going. And now they're 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 going to be at a huge step, like backwards, where it's like, I I don't know that they'll be able to build up the momentum in any way unless they have crazy exclusive games yeah. and fix all the issues they're having with the. Uh, the connectivity of like uh, d- devices. The biggest refrain I've seen from Stadia boosters has been, "Okay, this sucked, but XCloud will probably be great." So, in yeah. some sense, like this is actually a really good advertisement for XCloud. Yeah, man, it's it's interesting. I assume, and like, I, I feel like the only assumption I can make about why they would launch officially now is because they wanted to get ahead of yeah, they the want the name out there. Xbox Series X and PS Five, and not be kind of cluttered in with those releases. It was a bad idea, man. It's a bad idea. We'll see. Maybe by the end of this year, we'll be like, oh, yeah, Stadia really pulled it together. Like, they're a huge name now. We'll see. xCloud is also breathing down <laughs> the neck, yeah. which, is, which I think is, like, the thing that might be the death of them is that they have competition. Yeah. Now it's time for Squad Up. Brian writes in and says, hey, KFGD crew. I'm a 30-year-old father of three looking to make some new friends. I struggle with, I struggle with a little social anxiety, so starting conversations can be hard for me until I get comfortable. I'm up for I'm up for playing any uh, about anything on Game Pass and have a variety of other games. Brian's Xbox gamer tag is Big Ten sixty eight. Go for it. So go for it. Add add Brian on Xbox. Have a good time playing them Game Pass games. Now it's time for kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. To see what we got wrong. And a lot of people wrote in about uh, Pokemon. Which is fun to see. And so D Block <laughs> D Block says hi bless Ron. The global trade system, GTS, uh, premium cust- premium customers can use a feature called Judge, which allows them to see how strong their Pokemon are. So that's oh, what that is. Oh. Interesting. Cool. And then Boris and Zero Zero Rice and says, I think the anger around the price is, is that currently Pokemon Bank is five dollars a year versus sixteen dollars a year for Pokemon Home. That's three times the cost. And yeah, I saw some of that rotating around. And so sure that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then let's see. Reb writes in and says, you can bring Pokemon from every generation into Sword and Shield in theory. Earlier games aren't compatible with Pokemon Bank, but you can bring Ruby, Ruby slash Sapphire slash Fire Red slash Leaf Green Pokemon to the DS games and Pokemon from the DS games are transferable to the 3DS games, which are then compatible with Pokemon Bank, as are the eShop versions of Ruby or let's see, RBY and G- red, GSC. blue, yellow, red, blue, yellow gold slash silver, gold, crystal. silver, crystal. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. It's a convoluted, me- it's a convoluted process <laughs> that involves needing multiple systems and paying a few pointless, playing a few pointless mini games, but it's doable. Thank you, Reb. That's pretty cool. That's a lot of information. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Also, it's nice to know that uh, Imran was not lying to us. Let's see. Neil Biologist writes in and says, breaking news. Fantasy Star Online 2 beta kicks off on Xbox One on February 7th, 2020. Hell yeah. That beta test will be available on Xbox One. But I guess you've copied and pasted the same thing. Um, begins at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll wrap up Sunday, February 9th at 12 a.m. Pacific time. Da, 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 da. It's fully localized. Da, 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 mm, mm, mm. I'm going to play that game for an hour and be like, I like Fantasy Star, and then be done with it. <laughs> Forever. I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a lot of people. <laughs> Let's see here. It was rumored Ubisoft approached Massive to create a Battle Royale game. Mm. Okay, so I, do, I wasn't crazy. Yeah. Uh, more people write about that. Uh, Orson said, you're forgetting the craziest part of the RE rumors. 
werewolves are going to be in RE8. No, I read we, that. Yeah, we read it. And also, that was what I was kind of referring to of them being reactive to criticism because, like, no one liked the molded, really, in RE7. Molded. Missed on out today. Byleth releases on Smash Brothers today. Yep. So check that out. I'm eager to go do that spirit board. Yeah. I didn't realize that, so I'm going to play some of that today, probably. Uh, cash is pronounced cash. Yeah. I've heard cache before. There are different meanings. Like, are they? I'm going to cache some data versus this is a cache of weapons. You learn Whoa. something new every day. <laughs> Wait, it's spelled the same, but different yes. meanings. English sucks. Yeah, it's a complicated shit. <laughs> let's see. People are, let's see, writing in with condom slogans. Mm. Don't overwash your hands because it can dry and crack and bleed. Or bring some hand lotion. Yeah. Loxiton makes fantastic 20% shea butter hand cream. Treats your hands well. See, I'm going to be honest. I thought, like, I thought I borked the Pokemon story because as I was reading, I was like, I don't understand any of this, so I can't really give any commentary. But all the your wrongs are in here you know, are, are make me feel better. Good. Because I was expecting a million. There's only like five. Yeah. And so I think we nailed it. Also, it's possible no one else knows about Pokemon. That too. Yeah. You know, Pokemon Home. When I was reading through the information and trying, because like, the thing is, like preparing for this show today, I got in like an hour before the show and then the explosion happened and that derailed me man because i was like i want to know what's going <laughs> that on was out scary. there scary it was that really was, scary i was like what the fuck so is i was this? like do i have to evacuate and so i didn't have enough time to like research the pokemon stuff and so it, it kind of sounded like glass breaking but also could have been a car accident right. yeah like it sounded Instead, like a lot of little explosions yeah when i came down and i smelled the burning and i saw you and greg leaving the studio i'm like <laughs> oh shit they've done it <laughs> it's like oh shit <laughs> what did they do <laughs> what just happened <laughs> they set the studio on fire do i still get paid <laughs> of course, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily, each and every weekday live right here on twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games. We run you through the nerdy news you need to know about. We have a Patreon post show for those that are subbed at the silver level of patreon.com slash Kind of Funny Games. So stick around for that. Otherwise, until next time, Game Daily.